cemetery. <laughs> I thought I'd make Mark run that through one more time. See? <laughs> oh, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, it's much different than yesterday at this time. Yesterday at this time it was black and noisy and wet. Today we have a beautiful day. Well, we're glad to see you all here this morning. For those of you watching online, please give us a shout out in the comments. Let us know that you've joined us. Just a few announcements this morning before we get started. Uh, this Wednesday we'll be continuing our series called The Engagement Project. Uh, we kicked it off last week. Uh, and then uh, we'll be going uh, this week, we'll be in Creation the Ingen, which is by chance happens to be today's sermon title. So uh, we'll be getting a preview of that and then we will dig deeper uh, through the video and the questions with Dr. Tackett on Wednesday night at 7. Then next Saturday, so we got a busy couple of Saturdays coming up even after yesterday. So next Saturday we have season 19, the May races of Orange Track Racing. And uh, it's always fun to be out and about. And somebody, I don't know how those conversations get started. God starts them, those divine appointments. And then I just reach into my pocket and I grab one of these little cards and I say, oh, you like Hot Wheels. <laughs> Let me tell you about something. So uh, hoping to see a lot of new friends and faces on Saturday. Uh, registrations at 9.30 with racing at 10 o'clock. Then the following weekend, uh, May 18th at 6 o'clock, we'll be showing the movie Son of God. Now this movie was released 10 years ago, but it's a story that is timeless because it's a 2,000 year old story and it's been retold many times. We've seen The Chosen, we've seen other itinerations of this. This is a really good uh, showing of Jesus' life as well. So we invite you to join us at 6 o'clock on the 18th, doors will open at 5.30, and as we always do, we will have free concessions with that free movie. But unlike the movie, the concessions are only free as long as they last. Once they're gone, they're gone. But it's kind of like loaves and fishes, that throwback to Five and Two and The Chosen. Um, we never seem to run out of food. So that's a good thing. And then we'll take a little break as we uh, get through uh, the end of the month and probably a lot of graduations for some of you and men's breakfast we will have again on June 1st. Uh, there's a rumor of possibly a biscuits and gravy pizza. You know, the, when we hear rumors like that here, they tend to come to fruition. So I think it's more fact than rumor. So uh, just we look forward to having you join us. If you know someone who would enjoy the food and the fellowship and a time of devotion, please invite them to join us as well. That would be at 9 o'clock on June 1st. And then, of course, we'll have racing again the week after that, but then the, or, well, two weeks after that because uh, we've got a little something going on in that second week. But on the 16th of June, a little different day than what we're used to, uh, but on the 16th of June, we will be convening at Lowe's Park for the annual Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival flag retirement ceremony. And it's a time also that we get to honor our veterans. Uh, Mark and I have had the pleasure and, of doing this and the honor of doing this for the last several years, uh, where we both stand as they are retiring those flags. And we read off all the names of those uh, who have served our country and have fallen over the past 12 months. Uh, you don't realize how many people serve until you start reading those names and it, it hits you, but then it hits you a little bit more when there's a name or multiple names on that list that, uh, that you know, and there's already one on that list that I know we'll be reading this year. Um, with that, uh, if you go to Grace Street Church and go to the In the Community page, you can find out more about that. You can see a little bit of a uh, little video uh, that was posted up on Facebook, I think it was two years ago, of that ceremony, so you can see what that looks like. Then for those of you that are worshiping online, uh, we'll be putting a link to the worship music into uh, the feed there for you. Uh, it'll have the announcements, the worship and uh, also the trailer for the movie at the end of it. 
And then certainly after the server or sermon gets posted later today, that will also get added. So it's all together in one spot. So you can always go back and check it uh, in the future. With that, let us calm our hearts and slow things down a little bit and prepare to hear the word that the Father has given to Mark today. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. Each day is a new blessing. Each day is a new opportunity. Each day, we should feel honored and blessed to be your children. And as we hear the message today, Father, we will find out more about what that looks like, why it's important, and how we, as we talked about a little bit yesterday, Father, that uh, how our faith comes out through the Holy Spirit, through our actions. Open our ears, Father. Open our minds. Open our hearts. Let us hear the word that you have given. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes from Ephesians 2, 4, 9, and it reads that Paul writes this, he says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the, exceedingly rich, or the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Test anyone should boast, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Paul has just covered off in the previous verses about our old sinful nature. Here he's emphasizing that we do not need to live under sin's weight anymore. Sin's power is done because he destroyed sin on the cross and sin has no power over us anymore if you want to put it in, in uh, kind of the light of someone who has been charged guilty and is in court we've been acquitted we've been found not guilty so we're no longer dead in sin because we are alive in Jesus Christ. And because we are united in Christ, we can share in his blessings and in his glory. And then the last two verses. These, I love summaries because they're quick and they're easy. I don't know about any of you. I, I used to read clip notes. They're called spark notes now, I think. But it's putting it to a, a quick and easy two-verse summary of how we are saved. Not by our own works. Not by anything that we can do. You can't do anything to earn this unmerited gift. In an age where everybody gets a trophy, everybody gets a ribbon, everybody gets a reward, this Salvation is not a reward for anything that we do. It's freely given. And because it is not by anything that we do, we can't boast about it. Oh, look what I did. No, you can't boast about it. There's nothing you have done that brings that to bear. We are given life everlasting. Fathers, we listen to the message this morning. This message that starts off with a name that says creation and then the end game. God had an end game in mind when we were created. Father, let us hear this message. Let us wipe away all the false teachings that we may have heard in the past over what this is about. May we hear your word. May it come into our hearts. And 
become a part of us. Father, use the Holy Spirit to work through us and to make this part of our daily lives, part of the way that we act, part of the way that we talk, so that when people see us, whether we say something or not, they see you. In Jesus' name. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Isn't it beautiful outside? Yeah, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well, in our call to worship this morning, we were talking about uh, by grace we are saved. And, and yesterday at the men's breakfast, I had uh, James 2, and we went through James 2, and it, it talks about two different types of faith. And there's a printout back there if anybody wants one on the back table. Uh, if you'd like to have it. And James was talking about a similar thing that Paul was talking about here in Ephesians. And it's how we are saved by grace, by the gift of God, not by something that we can do, not that something we can earn. We can't work hard enough to get our way into heaven. It is simply a gift of God for our faith, for the belief that we have. So in last week's introduction to the engagement project, Pastor Terry laid the groundwork for what is yet to come. So we have 10 tours in the engagement project, similar to what we went through with the tours with the Truth Project from Dr. Taggett here um, a few months back. And he really brought out the purpose for which we were created in that tour zero. This is tour one today. And before moving uh, forward on our quest to gaze upon that crown jewel, as they say, in the nature of God, we need to cast a backwards glance and kind of take a look back at where it all began. You always need to start at the beginning to understand what the end is all about. And we can't understand why we, who we are, why we are here, and what the purpose is in this, in this fourth epic in God's meta-narrative that he has, the epic of engagement. And if we look over here from the Truth Project, you see those neat little things up on the pedestals, the little glass balls, those are called epics. And each one of those is representative of uh, a meta-narrative in the process uh, that we've been through. So we had the creation, which is the very first one on there. And then there was the fall and the redemption. And then we inserted a new one called engagement. And that's what we're on in this engagement project. And the very last one which we're going to get to is called restoration and uh, redemption. And so the engagement project that we are on then is going to be about engagement. Are we engaged in doing the work of God? Are we engaged in a relationship with God? And we talked about that again yesterday morning as well. So during the first tour, we set our sights on the epic of creation. And we have to ask ourselves what God had in mind when he created the world. I mean, we think about it and all the things that are in the world that God created. And you have to understand then the vastness of God. We have a hard time wrapping our minds around what we do day to day, but if you can think about creating the heavens, the earth, everything, and making it so meticulous down to the, the finite details that we went through in Is Genesis History, another one of these programs, where we took a look down at the subatomic particles and how they interact with each other, and how things are, have, have to be absolutely perfect in order to work. So what is the true end game then that God had in mind when he created the earth and everything in it and everything around it and the heavens? He had to have a purpose in mind. He had to have an end game. And that's kind of what we're thinking of. And that's what we're working ourselves through. And we'll have a wrap up on this because I can't go through it all today. But on Wednesday, we're going to do a deep dive then in what the end game was about. So what was the true end game in his creative act? And that's kind of what I want to talk about somewhat today. Why did he make the universe in the first place? So if we can kind of gain a handle on some of these things here, 
then we can understand more of what our purpose is in the world that he created and why we were created. And we'll get a picture of the, what the, lower, the larger story is all about then and where it's headed and some of the concepts that really spoke to me in this as we went through it uh, about the beginning and the end and what happens in between. So I've used this uh, many times before as an illustration and Pastor Terry used it in a message here a few years back. And uh, so it's a tombstone. So when we take a look at a tombstone, and I, I brought this one up because it has a neat little dash in between, but if you look and see what's written on it, and it's kind of tough to read from there, I imagine, but on a tombstone, you have the date of the birth, the date they were created, and you have an end date. And in between there, you have a little bit of a dash. That dash is what your life was all about. You're born here, you died here. What you did in between is what really matters. The dash is the most important part. So I've used this illustration many, many times, and it really should make us all stop and think about what we've done in our lives and where we're at in that dash. What are we doing? And when we think about that, are we making good use of the life that God has blessed us with? Are we filling in the dash? Are we doing what God wanted us to do? And it really comes at a time when it's too late for the poor soul who's laying under that tombstone to make a change in that dash. The tombstone reads the date of birth and then usually a hyphen and the date of death. And it's that dash in between those times that really speaks about what he did or what we did with our lives. Were we fruitful with the gifts that God blessed us with throughout our lives? Were we good stewards of God's blessing on our lives? And what it really all boils down to is this. Were we who God created us to be, and did we do what God created us to do? See, that's the story of your life. That's your purpose. Lots of people go through life, and they're wondering what the purpose in life is. Why was I even created? Well, that's it right there. God created us to be who we need to be, and to do what God created us to do. But what is that? What is that? Well... We all started as a blank slate. We all started with nothing. But God had a purpose and a calling on our life before we were even created. Did you hear the call? Have you heard the call? Did you answer the call? Or did it just kind of ring busy? A lot of times, unfortunately, for a lot of us, it rings busy for quite a bit of time in that lifetime, in that span in between, that dash time. It rings busy because we're so busy doing all the rest of the stuff we don't listen to God. We don't answer his call. We don't pick up the phone and say, hey, here I am. Send me. We heard about that last week. So if we go back to the very beginning in Genesis, it gives us the purpose for being created. And do you remember what that purpose is? Well, Genesis 1, 26 through 28 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, so that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So that tells you right now, God says, Hey, I've laid it out for you. Here's your purpose in life. You are to be fruitful and multiply, and you are to have dominion, over the things that I have created, the plants, the birds, everything, all of the animals. And that is the purpose for which we were created, to be fruitful and multiply. Now, most people, as I talked about yesterday in our men's breakfast, most people, that means we got to go out and have babies. And while that may be part of it, but see that 
He wanted us to be fruitful with all of the blessings, all of the created things. He wanted us to multiply what he had provided for us. So it's so important that there's over 41 verses in the Bible that talk about being fruitful and multiplying what God has given us. 41 times. You think we'd get it by now. The reason it's so important is because it is the same scripture that tells us that in being fruitful, that also then, by us being fruitful and doing the will of God, as it says in the scripture, that brings glory to God. So if you want to know how you want to please God, be fruitful and multiply the things that he has provided for us, the blessings that he has provided for us. Make use of that time between the dates. Be fruitful and multiply. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means because we have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and everything else, that we are stewards of that creation. We are curators of the blessings that he has blessed us with. And so we've got to take good care of those things. But moreover, we have to make sure that those creatures then can be fruitful and multiply because they are, again, created by God. So it's more than us just going out and having babies, but it's more of taking the blessing and multiplying those blessings out to further the kingdom of God. So none of this, none of this whatsoever, all of the world that he created, all of the animals, none of it was done by happenstance. It wasn't done just out of a big bang. It doesn't work that way. And so it's not a random chance. It's the immutable design of God's creation. Immutable meaning that in God's creative senses in there, everything was planned down to the very, very most finite detail. It's an immutable design, which means we can't change the design that God had created things to be. It is God who created those things. It's everlasting. It's everlasting. Now, recently I saw this posting from a clip of the show Young Shelton. So if any of you guys have ever seen that show, it's kind of a, a, a big thing. It's the Big Bang Theory spin-off type thing of when Shelton was a little boy. And now he, he, is, he is totally fixated on physics and science. And in doing so, then he denies that there, there could be a God because he's atheistic in his views. And many of you know that, that science is his only focus on life. So at the end of the message today, because we can't show it during the message in here, I have a little clip about Sheldon, and it's amazing to hear his insights that he's giving his mother. Now, if you guys have watched the show, his mother is what you would term a a Bible thumper, and she is, she's, she's a thumper. Um, and so, but she's lost her way because of something that happened in the church. And we were talking about this as well, about, you know, a lot of people get disenfranchised with the church or from the church because of something someone or someone else in the church said. And what I've always said is if you go to church, and you get in addition franchised by something that happened in the church. And most of us have experienced something bad in a church at one point in time or another. But see, if you get disenfranchised from that and you stop going to church, see, you weren't going to church for God to begin with. You weren't there for the right reason. And you stopped going to the church for the wrong reason. So when we take a look at these things, there's a bigger picture that we have to be aware of. And we're part of that bigger picture. And if we just check out, guess what? We never get to fully live out that life that God planned for us. So God is telling us in Genesis that we're to be cultivators of God's creation. Now, cultivators, a lot of people, if you're into farm equipment and things like that, cultivators go down the rows of, of the crops, and they wipe out the weeds, and take away the stuff so we have a really good crop. And that's what God wants us to do as well. We, he wants us to prune away the bad stuff to be able to have the good stuff flourish. 
flourishing meaning expand and explode and have great things come of it. And we're to be stewards of all things that God created. When he put this perspective in the example that Jesus gave the disciples in the, par in the parable of the ten talents, and if you guys remember that parable of the ten talents, we had uh, some people went out and invested that and brought it back tenfold to him. Some back fivefold or doubled it. And then others, they took it and they buried it in the ground. And he came back and he goes, well, here's your talent back. And you did nothing with it. See, they weren't good stewards of what God had blessed them with. They didn't make it fruitful and multiply. Some did, some didn't. So what did he do? He called those people that buried the talents in the ground and just handed it back to them, did nothing with it. He called them wicked because they didn't do what God's will was, and that was to multiply those talents. So we are to be fruitful and multiply, and the returns would accomplish the reason that God sent Jesus to us then. You see, the fruits of God's creation are what brings glory to God. That's key for us to understand as we move on through our lives, and we have to understand what our purpose in life is. The fruits of God's creation are what bring glory to God. So if we want to bring glory to God, so when our time's up at the, at the end date there, at the end game, and we go to see God, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. But if we bury our stuff in, we, we're not good, good curators. We're not good stewards of the blessings God gives us. You know what else he'll say? Uh, go away from me. You wake a person, go and serve the ones you served while back on earth. You didn't do my will, you did your own will. And so I think we all want the former, not the latter, to be told to us when we get there. So as a result, God delights in the flourishings of the life that he created. And we are that life, uniquely and wonderfully made in the image of God. We're made in the image. But there is a caveat in the endowment from God is we must do our part. Sound familiar? I tell you guys that all the time. And this comes to us in several ways. One of the most important ways <laughs> is that we must be and abide in Jesus. We have to have a relationship with God. We talked about that again yesterday. We, we had a great discussion, I thought, yesterday. Of course, I did most talking, I guess. As usual. But it was good in the fact that we could understand and relate to what God wants. And that's all about relationship. He wants us to know him, not know of him. He wants us to know him, be and abide with him. That's what the scripture says. So John 15, one through eight tells us our part in his plan. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Now, most people don't understand what a vine dresser is, but if you have ever worked a, uh, a vineyard or anything like that, you go through and you prune back the vines, and then the next year they will flourish, and you'll get more fruit. Every branch of me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, and as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I am him, bear much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather him up and throw him into the fire and they will be burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so that you will be my disciples. That says a lot. You know what your pur purpose is in life? Reread John 15, one through eight. It tells you. It tells you right there. We are to be a part of the vine. We are to be in communion with each other as the family of God, the church, as we are all gathered together. 
And if we are in, the, uh, if we are being and abiding with each other, as God said, then we do what God wants us to do, which is to edify each other. And we talked about edification yesterday as well. To lift each other up. To give each other a hand up. Not necessarily a hand up. A hand up will create new life in you. It will help you out of your situation and bring you back into restoration, is what it's called. The life that God had chosen for you. But see, if you just get a hand out, you take it, you're still in the same situation. Nothing changed in your life. So he wants us to edify each other, lift us up out of the, out of the things of life that are weighing us down, out of the problems that we have. See, abiding is the key. And you cannot abide in Jesus and only have a casual relationship with him. You can abide in him. You cannot abide in him if you only simply know of him. I've said this many times, you can't have a true relationship without commitment. You have to be committed to Christ. You have to be committed to God without being in communion with other believers. And until we gather together, we're not doing what God has called us to do. And we can only have a passing glimpse of what God intended for us, for our lives, to be his created children, a family of God. That's why we are called children of God. And that is why he is called our father. Is because we are a family joined together in communion, committed to a relationship. In a familial relationship, we have a love and a common bond for each other. That is what God is calling for us to do as well. Is to have that love and that common bond. So does Jesus call us only to be lukewarm in our faith of our beliefs? No, 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 no. He calls us to be on fire. And see, a log that falls from a fire will quickly die out. But a log that remains in that fire will burn brightly and bring light to others. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to brightly shine before others so that others will say, Hey, what's with this guy? I love it. He seems to be on fire. He seems to really, really be doing things that God wants him to do. But if we roll off to the side by ourselves, we'll quickly die out. We are more together than what we are alone. And we were created to join together to do greater things than what we can do by ourselves. Flourishing in the process, being fruitful and spreading the kingdom of God together. Together. In Paul's letters to the Colossians uh, 1, 9 through 10, it gives an example of how godly people edify each other by the design of God, by the design of God. I want you to understand that. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's what our study is about. That's what the whole engagement project is about, is being able to come together and bear knowledge. What do we do when we have the knowledge? When we gain that knowledge, we grow. We grow in the relationship with God. As we grow in our relationship with God, he reveals more of his spirit to us, and he gives us more blessings. As we get more blessings then. We are to curate those properly and to go and spread those blessings to others. Not hold them up in little... I remember the story I had to read back when I was in high school. Silas Marner was the name of the book. Maybe you guys had to read it too. So Silas took all his money and he put it into little mason jars. And he screwed the lids down tight and he buried mason jars all over his yard. You know what happened to him when he died? Nobody knew anything about it. It was all gone. He wasn't a good steward of what God had given him. So how do we fulfill God's will for us to be fruitful? In one word, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, engagement. Engagement. You can't sit idly by and be engaged. Engagement means you have to be active in the process. We have to be actively going out and doing the will of God. 
not just by ourselves, but by engaging others in that quest to glorify God. Our very purpose in life. Oh, there you have it. Our very purpose in life is to bring glory to God in all that we say and all that we do. I pray that every day on my way into work. I, I say that prayer every day. So we do that from the womb, certainly, by multiplying and having children and things like that. But we also do it by vocationally. Now by that, I mean being who God created us to be and flourishing in that. In that. Not sitting idly by. We need to go and do what God created us to do and to be who God created us to be. Not trying to be and live someone else's life, but to make the most of our own life. That life between the two dates, that dash line. See, we need to go through our life to fill out that dash. To be fruitful and multiply the blessings that God gives us each and every day. And in doing so, then we bring the glory to God. We are one body made up by many parts of God's immutable design. And we were created to do different things, but in glorious harmony with each other, in tune with the Holy Spirit's guiding. And that, I think, is, is really uh, the guiding presence of the Holy Spirit that God sent. He sent that advocate to live and dwell within us as our relationship with God grows. See, we talked about this a few weeks back when the when the disciples, when Jesus had discipled these guys. Now these guys walked and talked and ate with him each and every day. They slept all together in communion with each other. But guess what? He said, I don't want you to go out and fulfill the commission that I had given to you, which was to go into all the world and make disciples of all men, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. But he said, wait until the Spirit comes upon you. That advocate comes upon you first then go. And that's what he does with us. God didn't send us forth to do this alone. He empowers us through knowledge and growth and he equips us to do it in union with each other. He says, hey, we're, we can do more as a group than we can individually. So what is it that keeps us from going and doing our calling? Well, Dr. Tackett, he calls it the three S's of the hissing servant. And the first S is skepticism, keeping us in doubt of who he is and what he can do. Skepticism can keep us from fulfilling our purpose and our destiny. It's a real and present danger, and we have to see it for that in our life. If skepticism is holding you back, if skepticism and that doubt is creeping into your life and saying, I'm not sure God is really real, I'm not sure that he can do what he says he can do, and I certainly don't think that I can do what he says I can do. That skepticism, see, that, that's the, one of the essence of that hissing serpent. Satan speaking into our minds saying, hey, this isn't all that's cracked up to me. You're not God. The second S is selfishness. It's the what's in it for me syndrome. Why should I give up my time and efforts if it won't make any difference in the world at all? I got burned by somebody at church. It's too hard. It takes too much time, etc., etc., etc. I've heard them all. By the way, that someone who burned, you burned, was not God. He didn't burn you. So you got to look at that one there of the selfishness and say, oh, hey, guess what? Satan's winning here. He's getting his way. So we've got to watch out for skepticism. Moreover, we have to look at ourselves and make sure that we are not selfish in those gifts and in the blessings that God gave us. We have to be fruitful and multiply. Significance. Eat of the fruit, said the serpent to the woman, and you will be like God. We cannot become fruitful until we are willing to abandon our desire to be the star of the show. We have to be willing to say it's not all about me. It's not all about me. The ambition to become our own end game quenches the work of God's spirit in our hearts and prevents him from accomplishing his will through us. This was the root cause of Satan's fall. Now for you guys who want, 
there's a printout up back there about the rise and fall of Satan. See, Satan, at one point in time, was one of the most beautiful servants that he had. But the problem was, he was also adorned as, have you ever seen the, the Ark of the Covenant? And the seraphims that they had? The wings coming back and over, he had two of them, one on end. One of those was Satan at one time. But see, he was so enamored with his beauty, he was so enamored from who he was in his position that he thought he was as good as God and as great as God. And it caused him to fall greatly. And he was kicked out of heaven. So, if you have time, read through that. It's, a, it's an interesting read. So this brings us to the question on this tour. Why did Jesus leave? We talked about why he came couple of weeks ago. But why did he leave? Well, to be very succinct about it, we can't be called to do the work of the king when we are still in his presence. We want to wait until the king does the work, because we know that if Jesus is here, he's going to be able to do it a lot better than we are, because he's perfect and we aren't. We need to go and do what he's taught us to do. When Jesus set out the apostles to build the kingdom, did he lead him out there? No. He stayed back. And he sent them to do the will, but he didn't send them out alone. Unprepared, he sent what? He sent them out with the Holy Spirit. So they had their advocate right with them to dwell with them, to empower them, to guide and direct them. So they didn't go and do it alone. And neither do we. Neither do we. We go in spirit. We go forth as the body of the church, the body of Christ, the family of God. God puts it on our hearts to learn what we need to do to do his calling. Then he equips us to go forth and build the kingdom, being fruitful and multiplying in our efforts, bringing people back to engagement, back to engagement in a relationship with him. See, we can't be in a relationship with God unless we are engaged in doing his will. You can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. If you ever wanted to know the meaning of life, there it is. Are you listening? Are you listening? We all know others who are lost in the world, who've listened to that hissing far too long. And they need to be and abide in the presence of God. They need to be in that relationship with God because they've lost their way. They've lost the calling. They've hung up the phone and disconnected the cord. We need to go and be fruitful in what we do and bring them back into the family. Bring them back into the church. Bring them back into a relationship with God. That's, be, that's called being engaged in the process. That's called doing the will of God. That's our calling on our life. Isaiah 6, 1 through 9 said, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the whole house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the, in the midst of a people with unclean lips. Then one of the seraphims flew to me, having his hand on a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it. And he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity has been taken away, and your sin is purged. And also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. And he said, go and tell his people. And he became engaged. 
Isaiah. Look at the writings of Isaiah. Look at the impact they have, even to this day, 2,700 years later. God greatly used them. He, he was dead in his tracks, and he understood that he was a sinful creature. And he was not doing the will of God. He, had, he was not doing what God had called him to do. And God came to him in that vision and purified him, made him clean, purged him of his sins so that he could go and do the will of God. And he understood it. And did he just go and sit back on the couch and binge watch Netflix? No. He went out and wrote and prophesied for the people. And brought God's walk, walk and will to the people. He brought the word of God to the people. That lasts for thousands of years. He did the will of God. He glorified God by answering the call. By being engaged. The prophet Isaiah was in a similar way when he told God he wasn't good enough. He was a sinner in the midst of sinful people. And then, if you read the readings in Isaiah, Isaiah described how he is overcome by the splendor and the glory of God. And what he wrote there, he said that the sky is torn open. He sees God in all of his glory, his power, his majesty, and his splendor seated on the throne. And it encompasses all of reality. All of reality. The glory of God fills the heavens. The seraphim or the angels of fire surrounded him. And in that scripture, they are described as glowing like fire suspended in midair with six wings. Two to cover their face. Two to suspend them in flight and two to cover their feet. Their splendor is only eclipsed by the majesty of God. Go back and reread this over and over again. And let God speak to you. All of heaven cries out in an endless hymn, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of your glory, and there's a tremendous roar, and everything shakes like an earthquake. And Isaiah is breathless and totally overwhelmed by the majesty of his vision. His first thought is, oh no, I'm going to die because I'm a sinner, and I have seen the glory of God. But then a strange thing happens. An angel, one of the seraphim, purifies him with a burning coal. And with that, God chooses him to be the one who brings that message of hope, that message of a living God back to the people of Israel who were stumbling and lost. Stumbling and lost. And he became engaged. So I asked this morning, are you engaged? No, not the very thing. Is God calling you off the couch and into his service? Are you ready to say, here I am, Lord. Send me. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we come before you today just as we are. We're sorry for our sins. But we repent of our sins today. Please forgive us today, Lord. In your holy name, Please forgive all others for what they have done against us. We renounce Satan and the evil spirits and all of their work, and we give you our entire lives, Lord Jesus. Come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. We accept you, Lord, today. Heal us. Change us. Strengthen us in body, soul, and spirit. Lord Jesus, come over us with your precious blood and wash us clean. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and anoint us and anoint us to be your disciples. Put it upon our hearts to bring praise, honor, and glory to you each and every day. We love you, Lord, and we praise you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you that you've given us this opportunity to gather here in your name, freely and openly, to learn about you, to bring honor and glory to God by being fruitful and multiplying the blessings that you bless us with each and every day. Open our hearts and our minds to accept this, Lord Jesus. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. <clears throat>
The words of the song start off saying, one bread, one body, one word of all. One cup of blessing which we bless, and we through so many throughout the earth, we are one body in this one moment. In addition to the chorus, there's Gentile or Jew, servant or free, woman or man, no more. Many of the gifts, many of the works, one in the Lord of all. The end game? God sent Jesus. And throughout his ministry, we see Jesus teaching and showing us the way and what's going to happen before, during, and after his ministry, or before, during, and after his ministry and then his death on the cross. One of the last lessons we learn is doesn't even appear to be a lesson, but it's when he breaks bread with the disciples one final time. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take it. And later in the meal, he took the cup and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. First Corinthians 10, Paul writes, it is not the cup of blessing that we bless, our participation in the blood of Christ. And it is not the bread that we break, our participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. The body of Christ broke for you. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. I think as we get older, this meal means more and more because we realize our mortality and our end draws ever closer. Father, let us not look at this as something that we just do on a weekly basis, but as truly participating in your family as a remembrance of what Christ did for us on the cross, justifying us in your eyes, making us right not by anything that we have done or ever will try to do, but because of Christ's gift on the cross. Amen. <clears throat> It's time for prayers for the people. So if you'd like me to pray for someone or have just let me know. And yes, the families that might have been hurt or by the storms we've had this week. Oh yeah, I've got that in here, so <laughs> thank you. All right, my voice is a little raspy today, so just bear with me. <clears throat> Father God, we come into your house this morning to praise and honor you in worship and fellowship. As Psalms 113, 2 and 3 states. Let the name of the Lord be praised, both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Thank you, Jesus, that in our times of suffering and despair, you give us strength through your word. You are a strong tower that we can run to and feel your presence among us. You are Yahweh Rapha, the great physician, the healer of body and soul, whose miracles point to the kingdom of God, as we pray for those in need this morning, we ask the Holy Spirit to rest among us. Thank you, Jesus. Father God, please hear our prayers this morning. As we lift up all who have had tornado damage this week, please bring your people together to help one another to clear the debris and bring hope and healing to their neighbors. Restore them back to, to be better than they were before and give them hope through the wreckage of this time in their lives. Give them vision for a better future so they can hope with what they are going through or heal for what they are going through. 
Thank you, Jesus. And we lift up our families, the families of Lori's co-workers, the one who has cancer, one who has AFib, and the grandson, Jace, who has leukemia. We ask for your loving presence to be forever with them and your healing power, the blood of Jesus to wash over them. Please heal their diseases, Lord Jesus. Be their strength and give them hope in the midst of their trials. I lift up my brother David and Larry and Jen for healing and redemption from their cancers. Comfort them through all their trials they are facing. Be their strength and their courage and their strong tower of hope. <clears throat> We lift up Terry and Diane's daughter, Amanda. Please give wisdom to her doctors and direction on how to help her through her life with this kidney disease she is suffering with. Give her strength and hope and walk with her daily. Please lift up this disease, lift this disease from her in Jesus' name. We lift up Mark for healing of his knee. Father, we trust, we trust you with Mark's life and we trust you for complete healing and restoration of his knee. Give his doctors wisdom in this situation to help fix this issue in his life, to free him and deliver him from the pain he is in. Father God, we ask for guidance and direction for our children and grandchildren and all the young people in our nation today. They are so misled because they do not read your word or even consider to follow your precepts. I pray for a radical change of you to sweep over their hearts and minds that they would seek your wisdom and not live by their own understandings. Please do not give them over to the path of destruction, but lead them in the path that leads to forgiveness and everlasting love. Please keep our homeless from falling into the paths of destruction as well, but lift them up and out of their situations and let them praise the one and only God, the God that saves us from ourselves and forgiveness of our sins. As in Romans 5, 3, 5, we rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and pers perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. And we praise and honor you, Jesus, and thank you, Father God, for all things. In Jesus' holy name, amen. 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 <coughs> Thank you, Denise. Well, as we draw near to the end here of our online portion of our service today, we would like to thank you for joining us online. And uh, the uh, link to the music and the trailers and everything are in your notes in Facebook. So please uh, click on that. I've, I've got a different selection of songs today that I curated this week. Um, probably a little bit different from what you guys are used to hearing, but I want you to listen to the words and understand what the message is in the music. Um, I, I hope it'll speak to you today. Uh, but uh, we have a lot of great things coming up here at Gray Street in the weeks ahead in here. Um, and so we look forward to next week for Mother's Day. And uh, so we'll celebrate uh, that as well for all the mothers present and uh, we uh, appreciate everyone joining us today. Let us join in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, every good and perfect gift is a blessing from you and you have blessed us with so much. Help us to be good stewards of those blessings. We ask that you would use us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing difficulties. Make us a channel of your blessing, a channel through whom your love, your peace, and your joy would flow out from, through us to others. May we be your hands and feet to bless others. May you guide our feet to places where we can go and be a blessing to others. May our speech be so that we speak words of comfort and encouragement and speak the truth in love. Give us the grace, enable us and embolden us to be available when others are in need. Lord, we pray that you would increase in our lives and that we may decrease before others so that your blessings would pour through us to others. And Lord, may we draw closer to one another and closer into your arms, Lord Jesus. 
Help us to have that covenant relationship with you, in communion with you, and bring that relationship to others. Thank you, Father, that your grace is sufficient for all of your children, including all those who are facing persecutions and dangers in so many parts of this torn world. But Lord, we are all your brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are all one in you. And the pain that one feels or the suffering becomes a communal distress for the body of Christ. So let us lift all of those up today so that we might edify those, lift them through these situations that they face, and let them know that they don't go through this alone. You are with us always until the end of the age, and you send your advocate of the Holy Spirit to dwell with us and dwell within us so that we might bring that spirit to others as well. So embolden us today, Lord, to speak up and to speak out and to be a, a light and a beacon in this dark, dark world. And so, Lord, today we lift up all those who are having to contend with so many dangers and difficulties in the world. Comfort and strengthen each one who is suffering. Draw close to each and every one of us so that your strength in your strength, we might persevere in these troubled times and in doing so, bring glory to you, God. And to serve as a faithful witness to those who are lost in their sins. Help us to bring them home to you today. Help us to go forth with your grace and goodness. Comfort and surround each hurting heart and bless those who are in need of healing. Bring relief to those who are in need and keep each one of us firm in the faith that we have through you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord, we